OK, well, welcome to everybody. Let's start formally this latest uh, edition of our sustainability leadership imperative sessions. Um, you've already heard about uh, muting, so it's not that we don't want to hear from everybody. Please use the chat box and there will be a chance for a little bit of discussion and feedback on the presentations as we go on later on. Uh, but just before we start, what is the sustainability leadership imperative? Um, Bernard and myself uh, launched this earlier in year, the year in May, and we've had a couple of sessions as a joint initiative. And the idea really is to have more collaboration across the sector uh, in terms of our sustainability initiatives. We know that the postal and parcel logistics sector, however you want to define it, has a huge footprint on every aspect of life, especially business, trade, logistics, consumers and governments. We touch every part of life so we can have an enormous influence and if we can bring together our initiatives, we can have even more impact than just individual organizations who have got, who are beginning to develop, as we know, and we'll hear some of them, some very strong initiatives. And we believe there's an opportunity to, sec to, to se develop a sector leadership. In other words, uh, quite a few sectors are going to COP26 with a, a sector program. I don't think Postal Parcel and Logistics has yet got that in place, but there's no reason why it shouldn't become a reality. And that because it's such a big and powerful sector, we should have a, a sector agenda, as it were. And as well as that, to share ideas of good practice, latest innovation, who's doing what, how to improve sustainability and so on. So all these kind of things, solutions, technologies, uh, are interesting to share and hear from each other. And today we're going to talk about going net zero and what does that really mean? And so when it comes to carbon emissions and the carbon footprint, uh, obviously we have a big impact, but that is going to change. How is it going to change? Some operators are starting to implement models and we're going to hear some of those uh, in shortly, but I'm going to hand over to Bernard to introduce the topics and I'll come back in later on. Derek, thank you very much for this introduction and also explaining what uh, the initiative is about. Um, today we are going to discuss, as you just said, uh, going net zero. And we would like to discuss and look into those ambitious net zero goals, which the industry has announced, different various players have announced. We want to look also a little bit more into feasibilities or concrete measure, measures that, uh, that delivered results and also maybe business models and changing business models uh, that might be required to reach the net zero goals. And most postal operators, or let's say many postal operators, have uh, in the meanwhile implemented strong sustainability strategies. And many have also published uh, concrete targets and goals. So they have committed publicly um, to those goals. And I would like to share a very quick overview um, on some of those goals. I assume you can see my slides now. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So just a very quick uh, walk through a, a few of those announced goals. So the International Post Corporation uh, had this goal of reducing the total carbon emissions per letter mail uh, and per parcel by 20% by 2025. That was from a, about 10 years um, a period. Um, then we have um, uh, Austrian Post. Uh, they are transforming their fleet, and by 2030, they want to have the complete the complete fleet 10,000 vehicles uh, gun electric. Uh, Swiss Post. They have also made uh, very strong commitments. Uh, sustainability is a major priority in their Swiss Post of tomorrow strategy, and as of 2040, the company is aiming to be completely carbon neutral. Um, we all know uh, Klaus Zumwinkel, who announced in March uh, a, a very strong sustainability agenda, and um, and uh, it will reduce all logistics-related emissions to zero by the year 2050. I think it was Frank um, Apple, not Klaus Zumwinkel. But oh, no. sorry, I'm, I'm yeah, Frank you're, Apple. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry. And Canada Post um, has also uh, announced the target for Scope 1 and Scope 2. So the Scope 1 is facilities, fleets, Scope 2, electricity, heating, and others, as you might know. Um, 
emissions by 30% uh, by 2030, which is just in an initial target and an in-between step, and they plan to reach net zero emissions by uh, 2050. And then we have PASTI, uh, they aim to achieve uh, zero emissions uh, in their own operations by 2030. And finally, Poste Italiane going net zero also by, by 2030. So that was really a quick overview over, over some of those targets that, uh, that have been announced um, that show that the industry is really committed to it and, and doing things and, and try at least to live up to those targets. I haven't mentioned uh, the organizations of the three, of the three speakers uh, that we have here today because I think they shall share their own stories and targets uh, with you today. We have uh, our first speaker will be uh, David Murray. He's head of operational excellence at Ampost. We have Colin Campbell. Uh, he's the senior vice president of sustainability at Boston and Bring. And we have uh, Jean-Claude Sonnet. He's the executive vice president of marketing, communications and CSR at DPD Group. And I suggest we go directly into the first presentation, if that's okay with you. Uh, so, David, are you ready to, to take over from here? Yeah. Then please share your screen and your slides, and that you can get started whenever you're ready. Okay. Right. Is that there now? We can see it, just not on full screen. Perfect. Good. Okay. Is, you see that now? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, go on. Um, yeah, look, David Murray is my name. Um, thank you, Bernard. Um, I'm the head of operational excellence, and I'm just going to take you through, I suppose, with my colleagues, uh, I suppose, in operations and transport and sustainability. Uh, I suppose we're on a program to introduce EVs, a uh, number of EVs into our fleet, uh, and I'm going to take you through more of a practical approach as to how we're getting on with that, uh, and just give you some of the, I suppose, some of the issues that we're encountering and just on where we are in terms of the overall program and um, just a little bit about on post uh, i suppose in terms of numbers we um look, we have 2.2 million uh, addresses that we serve every working day and um, like the majority of the postal industries we've seen massive growth in in the parcel volume uh, and it was 36 million parcels delivered in 2020 uh, and that type of volume brings its own issues and its own problems delighted to have it uh, and it's a lovely problem to have but again, it, it's, it needs to be planned and organized and, you know, you, how do you actually carry that product? And um, in terms of, of post offices, we've 939 post offices serving Ireland and we've 9,000 employees and we have 114 delivery service units. Uh, that's basically the, the unit that our postal operators work out of. Uh, and in Ireland, we actually have three processing centers there uh, that, that actually process the volume and send it out then to our delivery service units. Um, sustainability really is at the core of the business now. I suppose really in the last two years, it really has come to the fore. Um, and I suppose when we talk about sustainability, we're talking about um, uh, you know Ireland being a healthy island, uh, and we're sort of planning for 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 generations to come as well. Uh, and look, and that will all demand sustainability. Um, you know, it's not just a, a political speak on this, you know, on post really is leading the way in terms of how we're going to deploy EVs in Ireland. Uh, and we, we have a lot of backing from the government as well. Just to take you through some of the numbers, um, Ireland, we have uh, Ireland's largest uh, electric fleet. Uh, and we have been carbon free, uh, what we call between the canals in Dublin since 2019. Um, we were so in the process of still introducing eco driving training for for all our on plus drivers, uh, and I know that has taken out uh, 500 tons of CO2 from emissions. Um, the plan is that we'd have 2,000 electric vehicles in our fleet by by 2022, um, and you know we are taking big steps. The the 50% reduction in carbon emissions that was planned for 2030, uh, that that has been brought forward now to 2025. So. You know, it, it, it's a big task and a big challenge for us just in terms of, of numbers of vehicles. So we just have over a thousand electric vehicles and 110 electric uh, trikes in our fleet at the moment. Um, so post since 2018, 2019 has been going through a delivery transformation program. And that's really to understand what is the most efficient way of delivering the final mile. Uh, we, we've gone through a rebranding exercise as well, moving away from the old green, dark green to, to a lighter green. 
the, the majority of our vehicles now are you know covered in zero emissions and, and branded that way um 23 percent or sorry 28 percent of, of our current fleet now in 20 2020 uh were, were electric vehicles as well just some of the the criteria that we use now in planning our our the evs into the fleet like it, an ev it is a new piece of equipment um and, and it brings its challenges uh like one of the one of the, the big challenges that we have is that the 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 range of an ev you know it doesn't compare with it with a diesel vehicle uh, so it's the planning of the routes around the amount at the moment we plan that our evs can do a, a max to 80k uh, so they are the range of routes that we're looking for uh, and trying to understand how best to plan that uh, and how to extend that where possible um, in terms of building constraints, I suppose a new challenge within our building constraints is that the EVs need to be charged in a dedicated uh, zone with their own charging point. So that all needs to be planned around our buildings. Um, I suppose, as I mentioned earlier on, that there's been huge growth in terms of the, the parcel volume. Um, and it's to understand what volume goes to what route and, and what is the best vehicle and what best size of vehicle then to allocate to each route. Um, and that's all been worked. Through. And it's we had a lot of our postal operatives that were actually on bicycles. Uh, we have one of the oldest uh, workforces in the postal industry. Uh, and one of the, the issues that we had is that our postal office didn't actually have driving licenses. Um, you know, so we had to actually train up our postal operatives to get a driving license, uh, work with School of Motorings, and then transfer them onto into, into an EV. Um, there's other factors that we were dealing with, and we've noticed through COVID is that the streetscapes have changed and that where loading bays uh, were, were, were prevalent, uh, these now have turned into, into, you know, the restaurants have taken over loading bays in our cities. Uh, so that all needs to be planned in. And, and how do we now park our vans? And where do we park our vans when, when out on delivery? Um, there's a lot of bicycle lanes have gone in uh, with, with bollards. And again, this is, this is affecting how we actually do our deliveries on a daily basis. We've had two winters now where we've had EVs in our fleet. Uh, and what we're noticing too is that the winter has an impact on EVs in terms of the range. Um, it, it winter, you know, they'll have the heating on, they'll have the wipers going, and that that has an, an, an impact on it. Um, and we have to put a bit of forward thinking too with, with our electricity supply board as well to make sure that you know there's enough power going into our delivery service units when we when we when we introduce the EVs. I'm just gonna just quickly just take you through an example of one of the cities. So we, we've electrified uh, six, six of our largest cities in Ireland. Uh, Kilkenny would be one of those cities. And, and so one of the first things to do was actually define the, the city boundary. Uh, and once we had identified the city, city boundary then, it was to identify, well, where, what vehicles are going into the city boundary uh, and what customers are basically in there. Um, a lot of that was to understand, you know, what type of vehicle was going in, uh, how many routes exactly were going in and servicing the, the centre of Kilkenny City? Uh, we need to understand whether there are any specific cutoff times in terms of the, you know, was there a central bus business district that shut down at 11 a.m.? Uh, I'm planning all that in. Uh, and I suppose once once we kind of understood that, then it was to deal with the with the building itself, the parking, the allocating of dedicated spaces for the charging of vans. Uh, and then basically the reallocating then of our fleet to, to basically service uh, Kilkenny City as an EV city. I suppose like any, like any, every postal industry at the moment, the, the big question is what is the most efficient way to deliver the final mile? Uh, and Ampost is no different than that. And, and we're working through our, our what we call our target operating model. Uh, and that's really to understand like what is the most efficient way to do what we call a dense urban area and the rural areas. Um, I'm, I'm planning all that all in. I suppose in terms of of routes, you know, we we have a distribution of routes where up to eighty up to eighty k we can plan those routes to be EV. Uh, but once we start going above the eighty k, that that's a bigger challenge. Uh, and where how do you how do you how do you move away from diesel vehicles to service those type of routes? Uh, there's other programs going on within on Plus too in terms of our consolidation of buildings. Uh, and are we getting efficiencies there as we, you know, as we consolidate smaller routes into, into larger buildings? Can we, can we reorganize our routes uh, to be better suited towards EVs? So it's just in summary, um, like on post, it was the first postal service to eliminate carbon emissions in, in the capital city, which was Dublin. Uh, we have introduced a, a Mitsubishi uh, truck into our commercial fleet. 
Uh, we are working with the Dublin municipality to create a, a green zone in the centre of Dublin. Uh, and we are still currently evaluating how do we get up to 2000 electric vehicles in our fleet. Uh, it's going to be a challenge, but it's, it's one that we're looking forward to. Thank you very much, David. And that was a very clear and concise introduction to a, obviously a very big programme that's going on in Ampost. And the things I picked up from that is that you're accelerating the programme. Um, it's certainly integral to your brand, whole branding thing. And it's also a little bit more complicated than it first seems. Just switching to electric is not quite as straightforward. There are lots of practical and operational considerations that you need to take into account. And now we're, we're going to probably motor on through the presentations and have time for discussion afterwards. We should have plenty of time at the left at the end for discussion. So unless there's anything immediate, I notice there is one question in the chat box from Luke about the distribution of presentations. Just to remind you that, as Bernard said, the presentations themselves will not be distributed, but you can always revisit and download and watch the program again afterwards, which will be available on the YouTube channel. Um, so I think uh, if that's all right, well, thank you, David. We'll carry on and move into the next presentation, which is Colin Campbell, who is going to tell us what they've been doing in uh, in Norway. And I think you'll find again different but very powerful uh, ideas on net zero. So over to you, Colin. Thanks very much, Derek. Uh, just nod if you can hear me, just to confirm that uh, you can see my screen. Okay. And we can see the uh, screen. Yeah, thanks for the invitation to uh, to share some of our perspectives. Uh, the first part of my message is going to be relatively clear and uh, and well defined, and then when we get to the sort of net zero perspectives, it's going to become a little bit more fuzzy because that's uh, that's quite tricky. As we saw with the, the walk through of all the ambitions of the different companies, there's many different terms and goals and definitions being used. So this is definitely not not a level playing field, and we have to uh, trade quite warily. But very briefly about uh, our, our group, uh, Posten Norway, or Posten as bring, and bring as we call ourselves, our two brands. We, we're a Nordic operator in the Nordic countries as our home market. Uh, and as you can see, the logistics share of our business is uh, relatively large and growing, uh, accelerating in these pandemic times as well. Uh, and the mail obviously is in decline. We're about 13,000 people. Uh, and uh, most of those people are in the Nordics, but we also have the representation outside of uh, the Nordic countries and follow our, our large B2B customers wherever they want to go. Um, sustainability, uh, it's a big topic uh, in our organization and we've been working with it now for well over 10 years. Uh, and we've had a number of goals uh, that we've achieved in the last 10 years. Uh, and as was said earlier, we really noticed that the, the expectations of our stakeholders around us are really accelerating now. Uh, there's, there's nowhere to hide. Uh, I've been working this for 10 years now, and it was kind of uh, a gentle pace in the beginning, and we felt that we, uh, you know, we were ahead of the game. Uh, and now uh, the, the bar is being raised dramatically. But we've, uh, we've made some good progress, as you can see here. We've reduced our emissions significantly the last years. Uh, and uh, and that obviously is uh, is mostly within the, the conversion of our fleet uh, to electric uh, solutions, but also uh, gas solutions and also our buildings. In Norway, especially in Norway, we have a lot of renewable energy, so uh, so the building aspect is not is not a, a material issue for us. Um, let's move that little screen here. And so we have now at this point we have uh, um, just over twenty six percent. Uh, of our fleet uh, is uh, using renewable energy as, as a source. So that's really the goal that we've been working towards is having renewable sources of energy in our vehicles and buildings by, by 2025. Uh, uh, and uh, that's a goal that we're now in the, in the middle of reviewing uh, because as I said, the bar is being raised and that's just not good enough. Another aspect that we're looking at is uh, circular economy services, uh, everything from uh, delivering uh, camping equipment to people who want to uh, go for a weekend away, either to the place where they're going to go in the forest or home, uh, and other roles we can take in the circular economy. New services are very interesting for us as well, uh, and partnering with with other companies to see how we can uh, we can facilitate the uh, the circular economy uh, situation. So it's not all about uh, converting vehicles to renewable resources. It's uh, it's also about the services that we can. Uh, introduce uh, package uh, or, uh, automated uh, solutions as well. Delivery cupboards around the, the cities are also part of this uh, as an example. Uh, 
Another thing that we do uh, before I come on to the, the net zero reflections is uh, is working very much with politics, as I'm sure a lot of people do. Um, we actively work nationally to influence the framework requirements, whether it's taxes or incentives to, uh, to accelerate the development. Uh, so we, uh, including our CEO, is very active with, uh, with other big companies and making requirements uh, to, uh, to the governments, uh, the individual governments and the Nordic uh, prime ministers, as you can see here at the meeting made in Iceland, uh, and also a Nordic, I mean, Norwegian initiatives as well, because this is really important for us if we can achieve our goals together. Uh, the the cooperation as one of the SDGs is, is very key for us as well. So the current strategy, uh, we heard uh, from the previous speaker about vehicles and cities and new solutions. Obviously for us, electrification of the last mile is the, 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 the job that we are in the middle of now because that's where the technology really is available uh, and it's uh, competitive in terms of fossil solutions. Uh, but now we're also expanding that and we're introducing more and more large electrical trucks uh, and uh, uh, vehicles into our into our operations uh, and also we are we are putting caps on uh, when we want to stop ordering fossil fuel vans within our operations and also with our subcontractors subcontractors i'm going to come back to because that's uh, i think uh, as with other companies a, a key issue for us uh, so really it's all about the cities and also building green corridors between cities where the infrastructure allows that uh, and, and making sure that the infrastructure is developing in, 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 uh, in the same sort of pace that we need in terms of introducing vehicles as well. This is now the interesting part when it comes to net zero. Um, Science-based targets was, uh, was mentioned earlier and science-based targets is, I guess it's one of the methodologies that can help us to have an objective or leveling of the playing playing field, so to say, because it's it's an extremely well defined methodology. Uh, and uh, when you when you go through the process and define a goal, uh, you are relatively comparable to uh, other actors that to other companies that have got the goal as well. Because as I said in, in the beginning of my my presentation, that there are a lot of different terms, phrases, definitions uh, flying around. So we're now in the middle of, uh, of uh, our SBT process, uh, which is going to include our entire value chain, which is a massive challenge. Uh, we've got very good control of our own vehicles, our own fleet, our own operations, and we've done a lot of action there. Uh, but uh, about 70% of our emissions are from our, our value chain and subcontractors. Uh, so working with uh, reducing their uh, CO2 intensity is key for us uh, in the in the time going forward. But we have done spent some months now doing some significant analysis of uh, of data, and come up with an with an ambition that we are in the process of uh, of being finalised with the SPT Institute, which we hope will be soon. And a couple of reflections of the the key assumptions going into this. Uh, obviously, this is going to be no surprise to other colleagues in, in our sector. It's all about these three things it's it's pretty much about operational efficiency doing what you do really well uh, um, improving vehicle utilization planning distribution new distribution models looking at hub solutions in the cities uh, we've got uh, just recently introduced that in oslo and a couple of other cities as well and obviously looking at some of the regulation and risk basically we have no choice uh, as i said there's no way to hide we've got things like uh, the taxonomy coming uh, we're looking at climate risk, of course, which is an important key for our investors, uh, and also local laws and regulations and, uh, and CO2 taxes that are coming. So it's all about looking into the, uh, into, the, into the future and working out when are these things going to be mature in terms of technology, the transition we're going through. We see the solutions, they're there. Uh, but they're still quite expensive and uh, the, the, the pace at which they're going to be introduced is not that easy to, to predict. But there's, there's a lot of reports, there's a lot of information out there and we have a good dialogue with all our, our subcontractors and suppliers of vehicles and fuel. Uh, and there's really four things that we um, we uh, emphasizing. That is, we, we need to continually innovate in our distribution models. We need to industrialize solutions, get them to come out in big scale. Uh, even though we're a small country in, in the global uh, scale, uh, when we go out and buy vehicles, for example, we need to look at infrastructure and we need to invest in a slightly different way that we've done done before. And this is also part of the uh, the SPT process we've been through. And also net zero by 2050 is something we're looking at as well. And, and again, this is where 
uh, it becomes kind of a, it becomes a bit tricky because being concrete to 2030 is quite challenging uh, because you're looking uh, looking at many years down the line and a lot of a lot of uncertainties a lot of risks uh, and then uh, from 2030 onwards to 2050 it becomes even less tangible but we are pretty sure that our road transport is going to be net zero by 2030 uh, and uh, and also uh, the rest will be uh, we finished by 2050. Uh, and, and I think this is uh, this is where the current ambitions are, but I should imagine that those ambitions uh, will be the bar will be raised even higher, and the requirements for us will be to uh, to go even faster. But we are dependent on goods, solutions, and framework requirements. And my last slide is uh, is really some reflections about net zero. Is we we don't believe in offsets. Uh, we are fortunate, or maybe unfortunate, in that we have direct control in many ways of our uh, emissions. We know where our emissions come from. It's not like the finance sector where there's a, a long and complex value chain. We know what we need to do. The technology is pretty much there. Um, and also there is, seems to be this race to net zero. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, I'm not gonna use the, the phrase greenwashing, but uh, I think you need to think carefully through uh, establishing a net zero goal and being, being credible in terms of uh, what, what lies behind the goal. And also there are these risks uh, in the landscape we're operating in. Uh, and also there's another, there's another risk if everybody's going for net zero uh, at an increasingly early time frame, like 2030 or whatever, uh, the, uh, the mechanisms for compensating for what you haven't uh, reduced uh, are uncertain. So carbon capture and storage is exciting technology, which is probably gonna come, but there is still uncertainty uh, as to uh, the feasibility of that. So those are some of the discussions and thoughts that we, we are having at the moment uh, as a part of our, our journey that started over 10 years ago and is going to continue way after I've, uh, I've left the company. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, I think that was really highly interesting, um, in particular because you, you you shed the light on a few other points as well, which I think are extremely relevant when we discuss about net zero. First of all, all those questions that you put up here, question marks at, at the end of saying, okay, I mean, <laughs> it's easy to, 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 to use certain words or, or phrases, but, uh, but the reality is, is a bit more complex. And I also liked your uh, shedding some light on, on those other measures, such as, for example, circular economy, that also will, of course, help in, in, in reducing carbon emissions. But, but show a much wider wider uh, approach to it. Um, we'll discuss about those things uh, in, in a moment. But first, we, we hand over to, to Jean-Claude Sonnet of DPD Group. Uh, Jean-Claude, you are ready? Perfect. Yes, I'm ready. So Can you see my screen? We can see it. It works. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, yes, indeed. At, at, uh, actually, at, at DPD Group, uh, our sustainability journey uh, is a, is a a long one, if not an old one. Actually, it's back uh, uh, in 2012. Uh, we uh, actually made the decision to uh, to commit ourselves to be carbon neutral. Uh, that's something which is important because it's uh, it's based uh, not only on the conscious that we uh, we are uh, let's say part of the problem when it comes to uh, 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 global warming and, uh, and pollution, and that's why we have decided to uh, to get involved. Uh, in this uh, in this very ambitious program, being carbon neutral, focusing on the reduction of our CO2 emission. I fully agree with my colleagues when it comes to net, net zero, carbon neutrality and everything. There are plenty of words, but the, the, the main axis and the real focus we, we should be on is really the reduction, the effective reduction of our CO2 emission. And that's the core uh, element of uh, our strategy. And as you can see on the screen, uh, we have defined the global strategy of DPD Group by 2030. And obviously, uh, sustainability, sustainable delivery is a key uh, pillar of the strategy. It's not something that is being, being considered uh, uh, aside. It's completely within the business model. And I think that's the, the key element to be successful in the future, not considering sustainability as something that is on top of the uh, current business or the core business. Uh, and, and this ambition being carbon neutral uh, by uh, 
early in the in the 20, uh, 2012 uh, is based on a clear uh, commitment on the full perimeter uh, of our operations you have on the screens uh, the uh, the perimeter of uh, of our business in europe so it's 26 countries and this commitment to become a neutral uh, is really covering 100 percent of our transport and delivery operation uh, all over europe it means that the 1.9 billion uh, parcels we deliver every year are completely carbon uh, carbon neutral and when i talk about the full operations that has been said previously we cover scope one two and three it means that our plan is really focusing on reducing our footprint uh, not only on our own operations but also on our subcontracted operations uh, and that's a clear commitment we uh, we took uh, uh, at the very um, at the very beginning of our journey and i would like also to focus on something that is important because we, we are talking about operations we are talking about reductions we are talking about uh, uh, something which is very let's say technical but it's it's also important for me to uh, to mention that uh, it's really an expectation of our customers if not a demand uh, we talked about the regulations that are much more present and that will really shape the, the future of our industry uh, when it comes to, uh, to uh, environmental uh, footprint. But we are also shaped by the expectations of, the, of our customers. You have a few numbers on the, on the screen, I, I won't comment them, but uh, what we observe is that uh, not only the shippers but also the consignees are really expecting that the companies uh, take their own responsibility to reduce their own footprint uh, and they don't expect to pay for it actually at the end of the day it's uh, it's a common responsibility and we, we we need and we have to take our share in this responsibility and that's why uh, uh, back in the 2012 when we decided to launch this program we uh, uh, we have decided that this would be uh, at no extra cost for our customers. So we have completely, uh, let's say, embedded this program within, uh, within our business model and uh, uh, not charging our customers for this very specific uh, commitment. So wh what is our plan? Uh, our plan, so what has been decided in 20, initiated in 2012, it's to uh, reduce our carbon footprint, uh, meaning our uh, CO2 emissions per parcel by 30% uh, versus 2030. 20, 20, uh, uh, today, we are pretty successful in this objective. Uh, we have achieved a minus 19% uh, in, uh, uh, in 2020. So as you can see, the, the we are really focused on this objective and it, it really drives uh, all our investment and effort uh, in terms of uh, in terms of reduction we also set an objectives in terms of uh, low emissions vehicles and i will come back on it uh, later on and also uh, uh, sourcing uh, our electricity from uh, renew renewable uh, sources so that's the global, the global, the global uh, objective by 2025. And as all our colleagues and uh, other players in the market, uh, our plan is based on the measurement of our footprint, the reduction of our footprint, and for the remaining uh, uh, emissions, we do offset uh, uh, these uh, uh, extra, um, these uh, uh, additional uh, uh, emissions at no extra cost for uh, for our customers. So it's it's nothing new, but that's really the the the, the bedrock of uh, of our of our plan. There is also something I would like to stress on is it's not about uh, only about operations. It's also about innovation uh, and services for our customers. Uh, if we really want to reduce our footprint. We can do it with alternative vehicles, of course, but we can also revisit, reconsider our own processes and uh, evolve our own services 
so that it provides uh, an additional value for our customers and by in the same time reduce the footprint i would like to uh, to highlight two um two initiatives two examples um, we have launched many years ago a new service which is named predict actually predict is the proactive notification to the to the consignee that the parcel will be delivered and if he's not at home give him giving him the opportunity to reselect uh, a delivery option whether being delivered a day after or being delivered in the parcel shop uh, in his uh, neighborhood or being delivered to a neighbor or whatever and by giving this opportunity to the consignee to adapt in a very flexible manner the delivery process according to to its own needs and uh, and habits uh, actually we measured that the impact in terms of co2 emissions is minus five percent on the last mile so it proves that when you optimize your service when you optimize the first delivery uh, uh, attempt you reduce uh, obviously your uh, uh, environmental footprint so that's an interesting uh, example of how processes and new processes and new services can also contribute to the uh, co2 emissions and there is also another example uh, uh, it, it's based on our pickup network pickup network for for a dpd group it's our out of home network parcel shop networks and by giving this opportunity to consignees to be delivered not at home but in uh, their preferred uh, parcel shop has also a very a huge impact in terms of co2 reductions we estimate that on the last mile leg if you are delivered in a parcel shop it means that you reduce by 63 percent the co2 emission on the last mile so once again new services options given to the consignees optimize the global footprint uh, uh, of the industry and and that's something really interesting to be considered and finally uh, i would like to focus on indeed this last mile uh, 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 operations where where that's the 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 key the key element in our uh, in our business model and to accelerate the the reduction of our co2 emissions we have decided last last year really to focus on the city centers why focusing on the city centers because obviously that's the place where we deliver the most but it's also obviously the place where we uh, have the greatest impact in terms of pollution in terms of uh, 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 in terms of congestion so that's why we have selected the 225 biggest cities in Europe and define a clear objective to deliver them with 100% with alternative vehicles by 2025. It means that by 2025, we will deliver roughly 80 million inhabitants in Europe. So that represents 20% of the total population uh, with a, a, a completely uh, 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 decarbonized uh, solution so it, it has a great impact in terms of uh, uh, carbon emissions but also in terms of local pollutants and that's also something we we really want to focus on not only contribu contributing to uh, uh, the, the carbon reduction but also uh, having uh, uh, a positive impact on the health of the citizens uh, it means that with this plan we will reduce by 90% the local pollutants in the concerned city. So it's a big achievement as well. Um, and when we talk about the last mile uh, uh, operations, it's not only, and uh, that's something I really would like to stress on, it's not only uh, uh, implementing new vehicles, electric vehicles or cargo bikes, it's also rethinking our uh, uh, last mile operations because uh, in the past, that was, let's say, very simple. Having depots in the suburbs and plenty of diesel vans uh, in feeding the city centers. That's not the, the way we can operate now if we really want to be, uh, to be, uh, to be uh, uh, sustainable. 
It means that we have we have revisited our local operations, the city uh, centers delivery uh, organizations, by deploying micro depots really in the city centers to be close to the consignees and to reshape the way we operate the infit in the city centers. Having micro depots in the city centers allows us uh, to deliver uh, uh, consignees with really alternative means that can be cargo, cargo bikes or also uh, walkers that will deliver the, the, the parcels. So it's, it's not only the global uh, infrastructure, it's also rethinking the way we operate the, the last mile delivery. And as a conclusion, I would like to say that the big challenge for our industry is not really the last mile anymore, still challenging, but we know that solutions are really in place and there is really an acceleration since a, a few years. The big challenge for us is the long distance uh, transport, the line nodes, because today the technology kind of exists, but it's not mature enough to be industrialized. So the, the big challenge for us is really to focus and to evolve uh, our processes and, uh, and our uh, projects in this uh, uh, area, uh, the, the line nodes. And just uh, we are really in a, in a phase of test and learn, trying to innovate, identifying the best options, electricity, hydrogen, biogas, many options. And uh, uh, just as an example, for instance, our subsidiary in Switzerland a few days ago uh, has tested um, uh, an electric uh, uh, track. Uh, and for the first time, that was a world record, they, they did achieve uh, 1,000 kilometers uh, in a row with this uh, with this uh, electric trucks, thanks to a partnership with uh, Continental and Futuricum, which is a, 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 a Swiss-based company. So I think we, we are really in this uh, in this period of test and learn, finding the best solutions for the line all uh, uh, for the line all, uh, which is really the big challenge now for uh, for our industry. Thank you very <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Jean Claude, and I think uh, with all these three presentations, we've been treated to a, a great deal of information and insight into what going net zero means. And my reflections are uh, at one level, uh, there's obviously a lot of discussion we could have about how you define going net zero, what assumptions you make, uh, for example, about whether you consider taking into account offsetting. If you talk about the supply chain, what does that include? How far does that go? Uh, does that go to your consumers? Does it go to your customers? So, for example, if you have lockers and you don't deliver, you deliver to the lockers, but the customer drives to them, how does that play into it? So that's just the transport side of it. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is going, Bernard, can you take over for the questions? Yeah, I, I see Derek. <laughs> Save your voice. <laughs> um, well, in, indeed, I mean, there are so many interesting questions. Let, let me ask me one uh, question, uh, which is a, a, a quick follow actually to, to what you described. I mean, we have, you, all three of you are quite advanced uh, for many years already working in this. And there are many posts that are just at the starting line, if you want. Um, not everybody started a few years ago and has already reduced carbon emissions or transformed the fleet or whatever. Um, a post that is starting, to, to embark uh, or a logistics company embark on a, on a sustainability reducing carbon emissions project and strategy what are the first steps you would say okay these can really save you a lot at the beginning what would be those quick wins are there any who of you wants to to take that question i can, I can comment uh, on that to start with anyway um some advice from my, my side is to get control of your data, your, your climate accounting, your scope one, two, three, data quality, data capture, reporting, especially in your scope three, your subcontractor, your value chain is like a, a hard, boring, but super important job to do in the beginning. Uh, and uh, the other thing I'd like to say, obviously, like everything else, you need your CEO to be your sponsor and to have a very clear role in this work as an integrated part of the business. That's 
two things I'd like to say initially. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree uh, with uh, Colin. Um, data is key and, and if you don't measure what you want to reduce, uh, it's uh, useless. So that's, that's really something important, especially if you have subcontractors and, uh, and, and you need to have the global picture. Uh, I, I would also add um, on top of this, uh, the uh, considering sustainability as a, a, a completely embedded in your strategy, not, not something that has been to, that has to be considered uh, aside of your business. And uh, uh, so that's, that's, the, that, that's a key element. And uh, finally, giving yourself the ability to think out of the box. Just don't focus only on your current processes, your current way to uh, operate your business, because uh, it gives you the opportunity to, uh, to revisit, reconsider uh, the way you, uh, you operate. And that can be not only very positive, for your CO2 emissions reduction, but also for the uh, uh, deployment of new services and uh, providing new solutions for your customers. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I agree with all of that. And um, I suppose one of, the, one of the main things that we've noticed is, is just managing the whole supply chain of vehicles. Um, at the moment, uh, I suppose Ireland, but it's right-hand vehicles that we, we, we require. Um, and it's working with the manufacturers to make sure that we have the right the right equipment and the right size equipment and um, you know with the, with the growth in in volume and the size of the volume and um, the original size of the vehicles that we required that has changed you know as as the, as the volumes have grown you know I suppose the size of the vehicles have changed so it's it's the advanced planning uh, and one size does not fit all and uh, i suppose at the end of the day probably walking is still the greenest way to deliver something and uh, so don't fully commit to just going look we're good doing vans it, it is that blend uh, of you know walking vehicle uh, electric trike and trying to get that uh, to be the most efficient and and as economical as possible okay thank you in. i think i've recovered my i think i've recovered Sorry, my Derek, please yeah i've recovered my voice just to say <laughs> that i think uh, i think that from what i've heard that the Going net zero on transport is, if you like, the first step. It's because there's so much, so much more. We've got a question in the chat box from Linda about uh, the wider carbon footprint to the whole supply chain, so reusable packaging. And Colin mentioned uh, the circular economy. And if we and and, and uh, Jean Claude mentioned pollutants and congestion in city centres. These are not directly uh, net zero issues. But actually, they're sustainability issues. So, if we broaden out the, the the definition, if you like, and think in terms of even the manufacture of the electric vehicles or the consumption that leads to the sending of the parcels, uh, you you can you can expand it in all directions, and then say, for example, uh, three or four companies all driving down the same road with net zero vehicles. Is that a good idea? If they're all driving vehicles in the same road, so. Uh, there are different um, ways of looking at this that might be interesting, and I don't know if if uh, either of the three speakers have got um, pl immediate plans, if you like. I mean, it, it's enough, I, I know, to focus on net zero for the transport fleet that you've got, and John claude mentioned the line haul, but alongside that, we have to do so much more as well, and I don't, I, I think, I take your point about embedding it in everything you do, um, but really, it should be transport plus plus plus. I don't know if there are comments on on that from our speakers. Colin. Yeah, I think good reflections, Derek. Absolutely spot on. And but our experience has been, uh, I think, will be similar to most large companies, uh, is that we have to prioritise and we have to work on what's material in terms mm -hmm. of our sustainability and our emissions profile. So. For the first years, I mean, it really was all about the vehicles, uh, and now we're starting to broaden it a bit, uh, as we have a broader responsibility to look at circular economy services, uh, new forms of distribution, et cetera, et cetera, and, and broaden our agenda. But if you're starting out on this journey, it is really, uh, uh, you know, you have to prioritize resources, time, leadership capacity, uh, money, <laughs> everything uh, on, on, on what's material, and that's that's really the, the key starting point, I think. And uh, 
yeah. of course of course and you start with what's in your direct control which is which is yeah. natural yeah. any other comments yeah. jean claude yeah yeah making priorities uh, obviously uh and especially because uh we we experienced that everything is changing very fast since few 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 years there is really an acceleration so you you need also to keep the pace uh, uh so it's it's really important not to try to uh to embrace everything uh uh in in uh, in one role so making priorities is really is really key uh but there are some uh, obvious connection and actually that that's our position at dpd group we consider that uh, uh, carbon emissions were completely related to uh, to uh, air quality. So that's why we make the decision and we, we, we actually make this priority to consider reducing our food, uh, carbon footprint, but taking into consideration also the uh, air quality and the local pollutant, uh, pollutants uh, issue. That's why we decided to focus on, uh, on first on the city centers uh, in, uh, in Europe, because it's a, it's a clear combination when when you when you uh, organize the transition of your fleet in the city centers obviously it has an impact on the carbon reduction but also on on local pollutants and and and, and that's why we we try to let's say optimize our plan by defining these priorities and 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 connecting with the very obvious uh, topics this uh, main goal Thank you for that, John Claude. I don't know if David wants to comment on that question. Yeah, I, I suppose, I suppose the 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 cities really will 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 lead the way. Is what that that's that's where the I suppose the efficiencies and that's where the big savings are. Like I know stuff that's out there would be, uh, cities are looking at consolidation, um, you know, sort of green zones and and basically you you would consolidate the volume and, and one green carrier would bring it into a city centre. And um, so it's it's understanding that, definitely. You know, there's, there's huge efficiency to be made in using, you know, par parcel lockers uh, and pudos uh, and what we talk about, you know, slipper distance. Some have been able to walk to these and making sure they're in the, in the right locations as well. Um, I think that, they, that that will all help help the, the green footprint. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I think in the cities in particular, there's going to be an opportunity if you aren't already doing it to reach out to collaborate with other operators to consolidate and to have an overall re reduction in your footprint. We have a question or a question from James Hale from UPU. Um, did any presenter experience problems securing enough renewables? In other words, we've heard quite a lot about electricity, but I think some of you also mentioned biogas and other renewable fuels. What level of engagement is needed with the energy sector? Maybe Colin, I think you mentioned other other forms of renewables. You specifically engage with the energy sector to secure. I know. I know you've got a lot of oil there in Norway, but that's not probably what you need. We don't. We don't talk so much about the oil. We talk about all the renewable hydroelectric power that we generate, which is, yeah, of course, <laughs> a lot nicer to talk about. But yeah, I mean, I think engaging with the energy industry is is uh, hydrogen is a good example there because. Uh, obviously, we we also um, can play a major role in generating hydrogen, and then. Uh, discussing with them in terms to get the ball rolling in terms of production of hydrogen and infrastructure and everything for them to understand what our needs are in terms of you know transport logistics uh, so we engage directly with uh, if it's people that are producing organic based biogas uh, to uh, to large uh, water companies or industrial companies that want to produce hydrogen we the answer is yes we, we do engage uh, in order to make progress go a bit faster Great, and I'm I'm assuming that when anybody's talking about electrification, they're talking about renewable electricity because obviously that, that's not always the case. John Claude, have you engaged with the energy uh, sector at all? Actually, that's 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 the same. We are really still in a, let's say investigation phase, test and learn. There are uh, uh, not really one uh, energy that uh, uh, that uh, let's say take the lead. Uh, uh, for, for, for the future, so we are we are testing electricity, we are investigating hydrogen, uh, biogas, but everything is really depending on the manufacturers, on the uh, on the fuel providers, uh, on the energy providers, on the uh, infrastructure. Uh, also, that's that's also the key point, and we've seen uh, just talking about electricity on, in the last mile operations, 
uh, you, you know perfectly that the, the charging point is also a big challenge, even though it's completely under control and it exists, but the implementation of the infrastructure is really a, a, key, a key element. So I would say for, for, for the time being, we, are, we have plenty of contact, uh, uh, investigating, uh, uh, developing some tests and pilots, uh, but uh, there is no clearly something that is uh, that that is con that has to be considered as the key element for the for the future. I think that also the the green deal and the fit for fifty five will also help uh, uh, develop uh, and accelerate uh, the pace in these uh, alternatives uh, energy. And I think that will be also very helpful for uh, for our industry. And of course, that's why. To, to come back to the net zero uh, commitment, it's a it's a kind of a, let's make a bet uh, on on the future. That's that's really this because we we can assume that some some technologies or some energies will take the leads, but we don't know exactly uh, uh, what's going to be the, the their scope and the uh, and the way we will be able to benefit from them. So that's, this, that's still... this makes it this makes it more challenging with the de yeah. developing technologies and new solutions coming alongside as we as we're going through our plans. Mm -hmm. Just comment on renewables, uh, David from Ireland. Yeah, I, I um yeah we do we do work with our with our electricity supply board. Uh, basically, to understand like like where is the power coming from? Um, I know all the the power going into our DSUs that comes from renewable resource. Um, and I know just with, with our procurement team now, um, they insist now that there's, there's a full section now that it's required to understand, uh, I suppose, the sustainability programs that all our suppliers are providing to us as well. OK, thank you. I'm going to pass the microphone back to Bernard in case he has another couple of questions himself and then to take us into the conclusion. Yeah, thank you very much, Derek. Um, one, one last question. I think we have time uh, for one last question. There's no question in the in the chat box. I have maybe one last one. Um, when Austria Post announced that it's going to reduce uh, or that it's going to transform its fleet, 10,000 vehicles making electric, uh, with the message came, yes, they are twice more expensive, but at the same time, maintenance is much cheaper. Over the years, it's better to go electric. There's an economic argument for it. My question to you, um, as, as we state today, the main driver for, for, uh, for being sustainable going net zero of course, we know there are the consumers, we know there's the politics, the politics. Um, but at the end of the day, we all hope maybe it's it's the economic argument that's going to prevail to say, okay, but it's also making our business more efficient, cheaper, better. What do you think? Is the ar economic argument there or is this still a problem? Who wants to who wants to answer that question? Right. I I just go first and I just I suppose I, and I yeah. it's just a number that came into my looking at this morning um, and I was just just going through our through our accounts this morning like so we would have been paying it's a euro twelve a litre of petrol uh, this time last year it's now one thirty seven uh, so you you can see the the spike there and just in the cost of fuel um, yeah electric vehicles definitely are more expensive but I think over time you'll understand how to use them more economically and it is that over you know the test and learn and getting through those learnings i think with uh, fast charging points as they become sort of uh, more spread out around countries um, the model will change and we will we will be, become more efficient at using electric vehicles as well i think it's very early it's early very early days at the moment but i think you know like any any sort of new new technology it'll take time uh, to understand it but it will it will eventually be the, the most efficient way of, of, of delivery a few comments. I mean, we, we're way beyond positive t TCO total cost of ownership on our small uh, electrical vehicles in Norway. They, they, they are much more cheaper to, to run than, than fossil. Uh, and also with the other key thing here is uh, CO2 taxes, which the, the fuel price is just going up. So regulation is, is a key thing here. But at the same time, we have competitors that uh, that are uh, active. Uh, but the, you can turn the question around and say, what's what what would it cost to not do this and, lo and lose customers in, in the battle ahead? Uh, that's that's becoming even harder. Yes, I'm 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 fully aligned. And uh, uh, at DP Group, we already experienced uh, that the the, the, C, the the TCO is is sometimes uh, less expensive than the, the with the fossil one. 
Uh, once again, everything is really accelerating. I, I wouldn't have been able to say this uh, only 18 months ago. Uh, so it's really accelerating. Uh, that's the way to go. There is no other uh, way, uh, in my opinion, uh, because it's, uh, it's our right to operate in the future, I would say, because if we are not net zero by 20, 30, 40 or 50, whatever, we will be out of the market, clearly. And the regulation, let's not forget the, the regulation. With the fit for 55, you know that in 2026, the, uh, uh, the road transport will be, uh, will be submitted to, uh, to a, a, an emission trading system. We don't know exactly yet how it will be shaped, but that's also something that will shape the industry in Europe. So uh, the, the, the quicker we invest in alternative uh, uh, operations, the less expensive it will be in the future. Thank you very much, Jean-Claude. And I think uh, th this was an important message as well, and it shows how fast things are developing. When you said 18 months ago, you wouldn't have said it. Now you can say it. And I think it's, it's with many of these things. And, and I think the big accelerator is, okay, yes, you have the pressure from consumers, from politics, from everything, and you adapt to that. But once you see the business case, um, this is the real acceleration, because once you can make your business much more efficient and save costs at the same time um, and provide the service that the consumers want. Um, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the winning recipe, I guess. Uh, thank you very much to, to all the speakers here. Um, you really uh, shed a light on all those important questions. And I think you gave extremely important insights in what you are doing, what your strategies are and how they have also evolved over time and the different areas and aspects that are now included in very strong strategies and very ambitious goals, uh, by the way, as well. Um, let, me, let me also highlight a few things now before we close the meeting. Um, first of all, I would like to announce our next event, uh, which will not be an online event. Together with Derek, uh, we are organizing one uh, half day uh, at Parcel and Post Expo focusing on sustainability. And well, we hope that as many of you uh, here on the call uh, can can uh, can join us there live in person, so that we can also we had a, we had a chat before we started uh, this webinar, and that we can also stand around the table afterwards, have a coffee, and talk about all those things a bit more. Um, it's those really the value of physical meetings. It's not to be underestimated here. So uh, whoever uh, feels like, okay, this is, uh, this is really something engaging, again, a physical meeting in Vienna on the 13th of October, uh, this, uh, the sustainability sessions are taking place. Please join us there. Um, you'll find anyway updates uh, either on our websites or also on the Parcel and Post Expo website where the program uh, will be updated soon. Um, another question at the very beginning, and, and uh, Derek, you answered uh, that question was uh, whether the slides will be distributed, and no, they are not going to be distributed to the participants, but what we are going to do, we have recorded uh, this, uh, this webinar, and uh, it will be published on our YouTube channel, so everybody who joined here today will get an email with all the relevant links, and uh, I hope that uh, by today evening, uh, it will be done, and so everybody can re-watch uh, the presentations plus the comments from the speakers here, which is just better than uh, simply distributing uh, the slides after the meeting. Um, again, thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you very much also to you, Derek, uh, for, for co-moderating and co-organizing this event. I think it's, it's really a valuable initiative, and uh, as you said in the beginning, we started only in May, now we're here, and the next step, Parcel and Post Expo, we're accelerating, and there will be other things we'll announce very soon uh, for end of the year and next year to come. So that will be very exciting, actually, in the context of this initiative. Um, well, with this, thank you very much as well to, to all the participants uh, that, that joined us either um, on the WebEx platform or on the, on the YouTube live stream. I hope you'll join us again next time. Anyway, we keep you in the loop about upcoming events. Again, thank you very much to everybody and have a great remaining day. Goodbye.